Hi, I'm John Choptaw, this uh, semester's curator for the uh, Holloway Poetry Series, spring 2011. I'm happy to report here in Berkeley. It is spring, very good news uh, for those here. Um, <coughs> coming up, uh, end of March, the uh, fabulous of everyday life, Carl Dennis, and in April, the analogist of everyday sex life of insects, <laughs> Kimiko Han, uh, among other attractions, uh, to be found on our website, our refurbished uh, website. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Rose Martinez for that uh, service and so many others to uh, make things happen here for us. Thank you, Rosa. Um, so the website you can find through the English department and just by putting Holloway Poetry Series in, uh, that will get you there. Um, tonight's poet, uh, Arthur Z, will be introduced by Mark Bauer. Um, but before uh, the introduction, we'll be hearing from uh, Javier Huerta, uh, who will read some poetry for us uh, to be introduced by Margaret Ree. Thank you. Javier Huerta is an award-winning poet and scholar whose words tra traverses, subverts, and transforms the borders that divide and separate. In his first collection of poetry, Some Clarifications y Otros Poemas, Javier eloquently expresses humanity, a mother who loves her sons, even if they look just like their father, in the poem Ink All Over My Hands, to the sweet nativity and unvoiced fear of a child when learning his father is a coyote. In Portrait, Toward a Portrait of the Undocumented, Javier provides a pointed, eloquent line, a question we must all grapple with. Read me, I am a document, without an official seal, who authored you? As his first collection demonstrates, themes of documents, ink, language, family, survival, and the imagination grapple and question the politics and poetics of official papers. Indeed, a book, a book of poetry that emerges as a document without an official seal, and yet serves to provide a lens to which we can begin to understand our lives and the world we live. Embracing the playful, the hilarious, the political, the pleasurable, and vulnerability, Javier takes on issues of immigration and life through his vital writing, which transcends the page. Deservedly, Javier's first book won the Chicano Latino Book Prize awarded by the University of California, Irvine, an award given to some of our most cherished American writers, such as Gary Soto and Helena Viramontes. If the recognition for Javier's first collection is any indication of the power of his work, the reach of his Poetry Foundation blog posts may also demonstrate how Javier's writing is cherished in various forms and multiple genres. On a visit to Oberlin College last year, I was told by a poet who teaches there how lucky I was to be in grad school with someone like Javier. Because not only is his work beautiful, but so are his blog posts for the Poetry Foundation. I responded, you have to meet Javier because he's just as amazing in person. Poets like Javier have contributed so much to the fabric of this university and his generous support for all poets of color, to his teaching vital classes on Chicano literature and to his own poetry, which serves as a model and inspiration to us all. As an artist, Javier provides a voice so necessary in these times. I think about the threats against human and citizenship rights, where in a state like Arizona, bodies of color are increasingly state sanctioned to be policed and surveilled, where my own discipline of ethnic studies is now officially illegal. I think about the rhetoric that dehumanizes immigrant experiences to stock narratives or check boxes on official paper. 
in these times, I think about a poet like Javier, who through his writing provides a vital lens for us all to look through. He expands and reiterates what it truly means to be human and what it truly means to be American. I'm honored to introduce poet, scholar, and friend, Javier Huerta, whose work inspires and transforms our Berkeley campus community and our world into a better one. Please join me in welcoming Javier. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, John, for inviting me to read uh, for the series. And it's an honor to read with, um, with the poet Arthur C. Um, I look forward to, to hearing the, the poetry. Um, I was the, the graduate student poet for Holloway five years ago. Little did I know that five years later, I'll still be the graduate student poet here. Uh, it's OK, <laughs> working through. Um, of course, I haven't written anything new since five years ago. Uh, I might uh, read a couple of oldies but goodies here. Um, I, um, I found out recently that I um, had two books, uh, I mean, two uh, poems included in this anthology, uh, American Tensions, uh, Literature of uh, Social Justice. Uh, it will be coming out in, in um, April, and I'm sure I'll send out links and, and emails to, uh, to remind you of the um, of the publication, I wanted to read the two poems that they included in there. It's from they're from my first book. Um, they're also the first two poems that I that were published in publications that weren't published by friends. <laughs> so like, you know, if you get outside of that circle, you're like, okay, maybe <laughs> there's something there. Um, um, the first poem is actually a, a long poem um, for me. It's a long poem. Most of my poems are very brief. Um, and it's kind of difficult to read, so I hope you uh, hope you can uh, stay with me. Blasphemous Elegy for May 14, 2003. Exhale, breathe out, give off, let out, send forth, throw out, cast out, blow, blast, fan, gasp, heave, huff, pant, puff, whiff, whisper, whistle, sigh, wheeze, disembog, expectorate, expel, ooze. The abandoned trailer exhaled a 99-headed beast. Ella me espera en Houston. 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 I modestly propose that every year on the 14th day of May, as a way to memorialize the 19 journeyers, we hold our collective breath, better yet that we abstain from breathing, for a period of 24 hours so that one year we might come to asphyxiate the 14th of May. I offer this proposal not for the sake of vengeance, but for the sake of proving to ourselves that we are indeed more than human. Jose Felicito Figorea Gutierrez, Edad Desconocida de Honduras. Catarino Gonzalez Merino, Edad Desconocida de México. Mateo Salgado Perez, Edad Desconocida de México. Héctor Ramírez Robles, 34 años de México. Chelve Benítez Jaramillo, Edad Desconocida de México. Rogelio Domínguez Benítez, Edad Desconocida de México. Jorge Mauricio Torres Herrera, 15 años, de Salvador. Roberto Rivera Gámez, 24, 24 años, de Juventino Rosas, Guanajuato. Serafín Rivera Gámez, 34 años, de Juventino Rosas, Guanajuato. Elisendo Cabras González, 27 años, de Tulcingo del Valle, Puebla. Marco Antonio Villaseñor Acuña, 5 años, de la Ciudad de México. José Antonio Villaseñor León, 31 años, de la Ciudad de México. Edgar Gabriel Hernández Zúñiga, 17 años, de Cárdenas, San Luis Potosí. Juan Carlos Castillo Loredo, 20 años, de Cárdenas, San Luis Potosí. Ricardo González Mata, 24 años, de Plan de Iguala, San Luis Potosí. Oscar González Guerrero, 18 años, de Plan de Iguala, San Luis Potosí. José Luis Ramírez Bravo, 21 años, de Ajuchitán del Progreso, Guerrero. Juan José Morales, 24 años, de Nuevo León. 
Augusto Stanley Vargas, 31 años, de República Dominicana. Gentlemen, that the beast ran off terrified, I do not believe. Nor do I believe that it gnawed off this limp and lifeless heads. Besides, such a beast would have 99 stomachs, each full of urine and sweat. Yet his hunger and thirst would continue. Nonsense. Understand this clearly. There is no beast, only an indeterminate number of survivors, 19 bodies, and an infinity of noses. Inhale. Drag, draw in, gasp, inspire, insufflate, respire. Sniff, suck in, absorb, consume, annihilate, appreciate, rejoice in, relish, revel in, devour. The abandoned trailer inhaled our teddy bears. Affair, aware, bear, bear, beware, billionaire, blair, care, chair, compare, concessionaire, dare, debonair, declare, despair, disrepair, doctrinaire, ensnare, extraordinaire, fair, forswear, foursquare, glare, hair, hair, air, impair, lair, mare, millionaire, pair, pair, prayer, Prepare, questionnaire, rare, repair, scare, share, snare, solitaire, spare, square, stare, stare, tear, there, 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 unaware, underwear, unfair, where, where, where. Parece que va a llover. No hay para atrás de amor. Síganme. Es un fenómeno. El cielo se está nublando. La necesidad de nuestros países, los buenos, a esta triste canción, vi fotos del niño, no contaban. Hay una linda región, no sé si sería eso, con mi astucia, para darle vida a Sinas, una mancha y un ramo. Tengo todos mis movimientos, ni modo, las mismas pesadillas. Unieron sus almas, mi cuñado y sus dos tíos. Yo no los maté. Ay, mamá, me estoy mojando. Pi, 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 pi. En la eternidad, fríamente calculados, luego, luego cambia la página, nunca te podré olvidar. Ya, 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 ya. That's the, uh, one, of the, um, one of the two poems that was included in the, um, in the anthology. I want to read the, the second one, but I need, um, I need help from uh, my young, uh, I call him my mentee. I don't know if he calls me his mentor, but um, my young friend Joseph Rios, he's going to uh, come up and and we, it's a two-voice poem, so. This is uh, Joseph Rios, uh, uh, undergrad, uh, English major. <laughs> Toward a portrait of the undocumented. The economy is a puppeteer manipulating my feet. Who's in control when you dance? Pregnant with illegals, the Camaro labors up the road. Soon, I will be born. I am the heat captured by infrared eyes. Had you no life before this, are you not the source of that warmth? I am a night shadow. When la migra shines spotlights, I disperse. A body snatcher. I steal faces and walk among the people unnoticed. I wear anonymity like an oversized trench coat. Now and then I flash. <laughs> <laughs> is, is your name not perverse? Is your skin not your own? Are you not flesh? Read me. I am a document without an official seal. Who authored you? Thanks, sir. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a poet, so keep an eye out for him. Um, I want to do one more poem, and then, um, but I, um, I want to do it from memory. I never recite from, from memory, and I, um, I always admire the people who can just like read or, or perform like a 20 minute poem like from memory it's like mine's like 30 seconds so, so I'll put it um see i'm already lost um puedo tomar la energía de esta marcha y enredarte en ella tomar los tomar los gritos yeah see i'm not gonna be able to do it maybe something else that's written down <laughs> I need to work on it. Um, I'm going to read, read the first page of my um, American Copia, which I'm still working on. It's 98 pages. It's about going to the grocery store. So if you have any cool uh, thoughts, ideas, experiences that uh, came to you at the grocery store, uh, you should um, communicate that to me. And then I can steal it from you. 
Today I'm going to the grocery store. December 14, 2007, Javier Omar Huerta Gomez is going with Maria Pitaro in the yellow 74 VW Bug to the Safeway on Grand Avenue in Oakland, California. When I was little, my mother bought our groceries from Fiesta. She also bought our shoes and clothes there. Thinking back on it, I've always wanted to write a stand-up comedy routine to be performed in the voice of a Mexican Jeff Foxworthy. If your mother ever bought your tennis shoes from the same aisle she got the tortillas, you may be a mojado. Kids at school made fun. They could always tell who the little wetbacks were. Today I'm going to the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks. Last January, Mar Maria and I walked approximately a mile around Lake Merritt to get to the Albertsons on the 18th. And after buying our groceries, call for a taxi, which takes up to an hour. We learned not to buy ice cream or popsicles. Tonight I will open my refrigerator and utter, utter those wonderful words by John Keats, oh, generous food. You may not know this line because critics have reduced Keats to the great olds. Recommendation, read his Robin Hood poems. Whenever I go back to Houston, I make sure to go to Fiesta on Bel Air and Hillcroft to get some elote from the elote men in the parking lot. Then I go in the store not to buy anything, but to count the piñatas hanging from the ceiling. America, when will you be worthy of your 12 million and one Sancho Panzas? Uh, thank you. And I, um, I went back home uh, for, for Christmas, and I, you know, I bought a new digital camera. I finally entered the 21st uh, century. And I was trying to take photos of Fiesta, right, just, just to have for the book. And they told me I couldn't take pictures. I'm like, but it's for the book, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, thank you. When is a koan not a koan? When Arthur Z poses this question in the title poem of his 2005 collection, Kipu, it's in the context of a much longer list of questions ranging from what is the tensile strength of joy to who can ravel the spin of an elegy and counterspin it into an ode. Amid these apparently more provocative questions, it's easy to ignore the quieter yet arguably weightier implications of the koan for poetry. Koans, of course, are paradoxes designed to take the mind out of itself, the first step in readying it for the revelations that may come through meditation. They tease thought out of thought precisely because they cannot be answered. And while the asker knows this, it is that very impossibility that lures the thought to its furthest point. The purpose of the koan, in other words, is neither question nor answer, but the journey that it inaugurates. I raise this point because, at their best, Z's poems undertake a similar journey, and not just at the level of the line. This investigation for its own sake, no matter what may or may not be gained, characterizes the explorations of Z's work. The opening lines of Chrysalis, the first poem in Z's most recent collection, Ginkgo Light, offer a dizzying amalgam of images and an equally bewildering array of vantages, both spatial and temporal, from which they are viewed. Quote, corpses push up through, gnawing, through thawing permafrost, as I scrape salmon skin off a pan at the sink. On the porch, motes in slanting yellow light undulate in air. Is Venus at dusk as luminous as Venus at dawn? Yesterday, I was about to seal a borax capsule angled up from the bottom of a decaying exterior ice jam when I glimpsed jagged ice floating in a bay. As one image cascades into another, and as the field of the poem's vision narrows and broadens from the domestic to the celestial and back again, the reader is forced to ask if contiguity is coherence, if correlation is cause. Fortunately, the speaker of these poems often seems to share the reader's question. Sometimes these convergences are red herrings, as when, in part one of Ginkgo Light's spectral line, a Blackfoot architect constructs a spirit way to a center that opens to the four winds, an approach that reminds the speaker of the avenues that lead to Ming tombs. The coincidence and the poetic sleights of hand that map America and China onto the same landscape suggests that there may be some deep structure to the world's signifying systems after all. That is, until someone remarks, quote, Navajos will never set foot here. You've placed these buildings in the ceremonial form of a rattlesnake. The line strikes like it's rattlesnake, reprimanding those who are willing to take similarity as substance. Mindful of such similarities, Ginkgo light pushes deeper, sometimes to its subject's peril. 
The collection's title poem concerns itself deeply with capital M meaning, matters of life and death, in particular, the turning points in a life, a heart attack and the staph infection that follows from being hospitalized, or the moment of identifying the ring on a charred corpse as belonging to one's husband. In the words of the poem, these, quote, ephemera become more enduring than concrete, and we find to recoil from darkness is to feed the darkness. To suffer in time is to efflorescence the time. That these insights emerge as paradoxes reveals that sometimes a koan is not merely fascinating. Sometimes the truth can take no other form. And yet, as the poem's final image of scars on wrist and abdomen suggests, wrenching wisdom from paradox is no easy business. Arthur Z is the author of seven other books of poetry besides Kipu and Ginkgo Light, in addition to a volume of translations of Chinese poetry, 2001's The Silk Dragon. His numerous awards and accolades include a Guggenheim Fellowship, an American Book Award, a Lannan Literary Award for Poetry, two National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowships, three grants from the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry, and a Western States Book Award for Translation. He also has the distinction of being the first poet laureate of the city of Santa Fe, where he lives and works. Please join me in welcoming Arthur Z. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I'd also like to thank John Shoptoff for inviting me back to Berkeley. It's always a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be reading with Javier. It's, we're making it a multicultural evening, which is great. I'm going to read from um, several different books as well as new work. C can you hear me all right back there? We can. OK, great. This first poem is called Crisscross. Meandering across a field with wild asparagus, I write with my body the characters for grass, water, transformation, ache to be one with spring, biting into watermelon, spitting black seeds onto a plate, I watch the eyes of an Armenian accordion player, and before dropping a few euros into his brown cap, smell sweat and fear. I stay wary of the red horse Rolampago, latch the gate behind me. A thorned Russian olive branch arcs across the path below my forehead. And approaching the Powaki River, I recall the sign. Beware pickpockets, find backhoe tracks, water diverted into a ditch. Crisscrossing the stream, I catch a lightning flash, the white capped Truchis peaks behind to the east. And in the interval between lightning and thunder, as snow accumulates on black branches, the chasm between what I envision and what I do. I'm going uh, back in time to read a piece from Archipelago. It's a sequence in six sections, and it's called Streamers. And, um, there are a couple of Japanese words. The word pachinko is the name of a Japanese pinball game. And if you've been in Japan, you'll know that there are these brightly lit, noisy zones of fantasy where you can escape the mundane. And um, the Japanese pinballs are set vertically, so the plunge to the ball is really fast. And uh, the other Japanese word in this poem is enzo, which is the Japanese word for the Zen circle. Uh, in Japanese calligraphy, there's a tradition of drawing the circle. And um, Zen masters have often written a kind of koan to accompany that image. And um, finally, I want to mention that there's a, a book called One Word, Contemporary Writers Writing on the Words They Love or Loathe. And Brenda and John and I are are in it, but Brenda chose, you chose the word as, which I think is really wonderful. And I'm paraphrasing, but you wrote something to the effect that 
as does a lot of work and often goes unnoticed. So I'm putting that word on notice here. <laughs> Streamers. As an archaeologist unearths a mask with opercular teeth and abalone eyes, someone throws a broken fan and extension cords into a dumpster. A point of coincidence exists in the mind resembling the tension between a denotation and its stretch of definition. Aurora, a luminous phenomenon consisting of streamers or arches of light appearing in the upper atmosphere of a planet's polar regions. Caused by the emission of light from atoms excited by electrons accelerated along the planet's magnetic field lines the mind's magnetic field lines. When the red shimmering in the huge dome of sky stops, a violet flare is already arcing up and across, while a man foraging a dumpster in Cleveland finds some celery and charred fat. Hunger, angst, the blue shimmer of emotion, water speeding through a canyon to see only to know, to wake finding a lug nut, ticket stub, string, personal card, ink smear, $2.76. A quackoodle wooden dish with a double-headed wolf is missing from a museum collection and as the director checks to see if it was deaccessioned, a man sitting on a stool under bright lights shouts. A pachinko ball dropped vertiginously, but struck a chiming ring and ricocheted to the left. We had no sense that a peony was opening, that a thousand white buds of a Kyoto camellia had opened at dusk and had closed at dawn. When the man steps out of the pachinko parlor, he will find himself vertiginously dropping in starless space. When he discovers that his daughter was cooking over smoking oil and shrieked in a fatal asthma attack, he will walk the bright streets in an implosion of grief. His mind will become an imploding star he will know he is searching among bright gold threads for a black pattern in the weave. Set a string loop into a figure of two diamonds, four diamonds, one diamond. As a woman tightens her hand into a fist and rubs it in a circular motion over her heart, a bewildered man considering the semantics of set decides no through line exists. To sink the head of a nail below the surface, to fix as a distinguishing imprint, sign, or appearance, to incite, put on a fine edge by grinding, to adjust, adorn, put in motion, make unyielding, to bend slightly the tooth points of a saw alternately in opposite directions, as the woman using her index finger makes spiral after spiral from her aorta up over her head, see the possibilities for transcendence. You have to die and die in your mind before you can begin to see the empty spaces the configuration of string defines. A restorer examines the pieces of a tin chandelier and notices the breaks in the arms are along old solder lines and that cheap epoxy was used. He will have to scrape off the epoxy, scrub some flux, heat up the chandelier and use a proper solder. A pair of rough-legged hawks are circling over a pasture one hawk cuts off the rabbit's path of retreat, while the other swoops with sharp angle and curve of wings. Cirrus, cirrostratus, cirrocumulus, 
alto stratus, alto cumulus, strato cumulus, nimbo stratus, cumulus, cumulonimbus, stratus. Is there no end? Memories stored in the body begin to glow. A woman seals basil in brown bags and hangs them from the ceiling. A dead sturgeon washes to shore. The sun is at the horizon, but another sun is rippling in water. It's not that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence, but there's exaltation, pleasure, distress, death, love. The world resembles a cuttlefish changing colors and shimmering. An apprentice archer has stretched the bowstring properly, but does not know he will miss the target because he is not aiming in the hips. He will learn to hit the target without aiming when he has died in his mind. I am not scared of death, though I am appalled at how obsession with security yields a pin-pushing, pencil-shaving existence. You can descend to the swimming level of sharks. Be a giant kelp growing from the ocean bottom up to the surface light. But the critical moment is to die feeling the infinite stillness of the passions, to revel in the touch of hips, hair, lips, hands, feel the collapse of space in December light. When I know I am no longer trying to know the spectral lines of the earth, I can point to a cuttlefish and say, here it is sepia. Already it is deep brown. And exult, here it is deep brown. Already it is white. Red koi swim toward us, and black carp are rising out of the depths of the pond. But our sustenance is a laugh, a grief, a walk at night in the snow, seeing the pure gold of a flickering candle, a moment at dusk when we see that deer have been staring at us. We did not see them edge out of the brush, a moment when someone turns on a light and turns a window into a mirror, a moment when a child asks, when will it be tomorrow? To say a bell cannot be red and violet at the same place and time because of the logical structure of color is true, but is a dot that must enlarge into a zero, a void, enzo, red shimmer, breath, endless beginning, pure body, pure mind. I think John was uh, teaching this poem um, in one of your classes, and, and I never read it, so I, I wanted to read it this evening. The poem is called Labrador Tea. And um, I taught for 22 years at the in Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and I worked with students, uh, native students, from um, probably over 200 tribes across the United States. And um, one day, a student from Point Barrow, Alaska, and um, that's about as close as you can get to the North Pole, came into my office and she put this jar um, on the table. And here's the poem, Labrador Tea. Labrador leaves in a jar with a kerchief lid release an arctic aroma when simmered on a stove. Yesterday, when fire broke out in the bosque, the air had the stench of cauliflower in a steamer. When water evaporates 
and the pot scalds. Although Apache plume, along with clusters of western peppergrass, makes fragrant the wash, owls that frequent the hole high up the Arroyo's bank have already come and gone. Yesterday, Though honey locust leaves shimmered in a gust, no wasp nest had yet formed under the porch, repotting a spathophyllum, then uncoiling a hose, I suddenly hear surf through open slats of a door. Sprinklers come on in the dark. A yellow slug crawls on a rain-slicked banana leaf. As the mind flits, imbibes, leaves clothed underneath with rusty hairs, suffuse a boreal light glistening on tidal pools. Mark read a, a few passages from the title poem, The Ginkgo Light, and um, I wanted to read that this evening. It's in seven sections. And um, as I worked on this book, I became endlessly fascinated by the biology of the ginkgo tree and the ginkgo leaf. And it turns out that in terms of its biology, one of the phenomenal, amazing things about the leaf is it's endlessly branching. Many uh, veins and leaves form networks and in the ginkgo leaf, uh, the one vein splits into two. Each um, dichotomous vein then splits into two, and they keep splitting endlessly. So it never creates a network. You can never go backwards, but they're endlessly branching um, to make that fan shape in the leaf. The ginkgo light. A downy woodpecker drills into a utility pole. While you cut stems, arrange tulips in a vase, I catch a down bow on the A string, beginning of song of the wind. We savor black beans with cilantro and rice, Pinot Noir. As light slants through the kitchen window, spring is candlelight at our fingertips. Ice crunches in river breakup. Someone shovels snow in a driveway, collapses, and hospitalized catches staph infection. Out of airplane wreckage, a woman identifies the ring on the charred corpse of her spouse. A travel writer whose wife is in hospice gazes at a lunar eclipse the orange moon at one millionth of its normal brightness. A 1,300-year-old lotus seed germinates. A ginkgo issues fan-shaped leaves. Each hour teems. A seven-year-old clips magenta lilacs for her mother. Electrocuted, tagging a substation. Patter of rain on skylight. Manta rays feed along a lit underwater cove. Seducing a patient he did not anticipate plummeting into an abyss. Over Siberia, a meteor explodes. I am happiest here, now. Lesser goldfinch with nesting fiber in its beak. Love has no near or far. Near Bikini Island, the atom bomb mushroomed into a fireball that obsidianed the azure sky, splayed palm leaves iridescent black in wind. That fireball moment always lurks behind the retired pilot's eyes. Even when he jokes, pours vodka, displays his goggles, metal, 
leather jacket hanging from a peg. A woman hums as she works with willow, exacto knife, magnifying lens to restore a Hikaria Apache basket. She has no glimmer, a zigzag line is beginning to unravel. She does not know within a decade she will unload a slug into her mouth. Through a moon gate, budding lotuses in a pond. You're it. He stressed rational inquiry, then drove south into the woods, put a gun to his head. Vaporized into shadows. Quince and peach trees leafing below the ditch. Succession and simultaneity. The branch-like shapes in their sheets. Pizzicati, up the river, we will go. August 6th, 1945, a temple in Hiroshima, 1130 meters from the hypocenter, disintegrates while its ginkgo buds after the blast. When the temple is rebuilt, they make exit entrance steps to the left and right around it. Sometimes one fingers annihilation before breaking into bliss. A mother with Alzheimer's knows her son, but not where she lives or when he visits. During the Cultural Revolution, Shumo scrubbed one million dishes on a tanker and counted them in a trance. A dew point is when a musher jogs alongside her sled dogs, sparing them her weight on the ice to the finish. Loaves of bread on a rack. A car splashes a newspaper vendor on a traffic island. On the road of days, we spot zodiacal light above the horizon. Astronauts have strewn footprints and streptococcus on the moon. Chance sparks the prepared mind. A cooper's hawk perched on a cottonwood branch quickens or synapses. In the orchard, the sound of apricot blossoms unfolding. Mosquito larvae twitch water at the V-shaped berm that pools run off to the pond. We do not believe we trudge around a flaming incense burner on a road of years. As fireflies brighten, we long to shimmer the darkness with streamers. A pickup veers toward, then away, skewing light across our faces. As light skews across our faces, we are momentarily blinded and directionless, have every which way to go. Lobelia flowers in a patio pot. A neighbor hands us three bib lettuces over a fence. A cricket stridulates outside the window. And while we listen to our exhale, inhale, ephemera become more enduring than concrete. Ginkgos flare out. A jagged crack spreads across windshield glass. We find to recoil from darkness is to feed the darkness. To suffer in time is dichotomous venation, to efflorescence the time. One brisk morning, we snap to layers of overlapping fanned leaves scattered on the sidewalk. Finger a scar on wrist, scar on abdomen. I'm going to read uh, one short poem and then a new sequence.
And uh, this next poem is uh, back to um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's called Looking Back on the Muckleshoot Reservation from Galisteo Street, Santa Fe. The bow of a muckleshoot canoe blessed with eagle feather and sprig of yellow cedar is launched into a bay. A girl watches her mother fry venison slabs in a skillet. Drops of blood sizzle, evaporate. Because a neighbor feeds them, they eat wordlessly. The silence breaks when she occasionally gags, reaches into her throat, pulls out hair. Gone is the father, riled, arguing with his boss who drove to the shooting range after work. Gone the accountant who embezzled funds, displayed a pickup and proclaimed a winning flush at the casino. You donate chicken soup and clothes, but never learn if they arrive at the south end of the city. Your small acts are sandpiper tracks in wet sand, newspapers, Plastic containers, beer bottles, fill the bins along this sloping one-way street. And uh, this next piece is uh, a new sequence that I just finished a few weeks ago. I um, wrote it in collaboration with a visual artist and sculptor in Santa Fe, named Susan York, and um, Susan is a practicing Zen Buddhist, but she um, works in graphite. She takes uh, powdered graphite and she pours them into molds and she heats up the graphite and uh, basically um, liquefies the graphite and creates these uh, enormous sculptures, and then she suspends them and she rubs and polishes them and they um, are very large, but just before they get to the floor, they stop, so it's as if they're levitating. And in her sculptures, they're usually positioned at like one or two or three inches off the floor. And so when you walk in the space, there are these just very minimal, gorgeous, uh, pure graphite pieces, and then you begin to notice that they're suspended and tilted at slight angles. Uh, this is called the unfolding center. and um, to give you a sense of the length, it's, it's in 11 sections. Tea leaves in a black bowl, green snail spring waiting to unfurl. Nostrils flared, I inhale. We planted two rows of sunflowers, then drove to Colorado. Expectancies a seed. No one could alter the arrival of the ambulance, the bulged artery. I had never seen 100 crows gathered at the river, vultures circling overhead. I saw no carcass, smelled no rot, the angers radiating from him like knives in sunlight. I sit at a river branching off a river. Three vultures on cottonwood branches track my movement. Surrounded by weeds, I cut two large sunflower heads off six-foot stalks. Apache plume blossoms near the gate. We wake and embrace, embrace and wake. My fingers meshed with your fingers. Nostrils flared, I inhale. Time, time courses through the bowl of my hands. A black-chinned hummingbird chick angles beak and tail out of a nest woven of spider webs and lichens. Mature, it will range a thousand miles between coast and highland. Once you roamed a spice market for chai, 
gazed into a mausoleum's keyhole entry and discovered in synaptic memories linkages that smoke, linkages that flower. The owls never return to the hole high up the arroyo bank. Each spring, clusters of wild irises rise in the field. Leaning on a cedar bench, we view fireworks bursting into gold arrays and tilt on the outgoing tide of breath. Fireflies brighten the darkening air. Desires manifest here, here, and here's the infinite in the intervening emptiness. Damn, I'm walking on the roof of hell. I need a smoke. I'm not a procrastinator. This sling nags me. Where's my arm won't budge, my lighter. I hobble, fidget, can't drive. I'm a piece of shit if I can't cast overhead and unspool that speckled fly onto blue flowing water. Damn, I miss that bend in the Pecos. I crave Bolivia when I lift that serape out of the trunk and finger the cochineal dyed weft and reach that slit at the neck. My mind floods and I need to hang. I need another drag at night if my toes can't wiggle out of the sheets and relax, I can't sleep. And if I can't sleep, I can't fly fish. B, I'm going to a lodge near Traverse Bay where a stream shimmers with cutthroats, nearingbow trout. Why, I'm shrinking inside this body. Let me out. It's fucking paradise here. I'll go back in and after I needle that willow into that Apache basket, under the overhead lights, I won't have to squint. It will all be repaired. The Hubble telescope spots a firefly from 10,000 miles away. Consciousness is an infinite net in which each hanging jewel absorbs and reflects every other. A dog licks her fur and a green fly pops out. Homeless, a teenage girl at a stoplight. When he ignites yellow cedar in a wood stove, the float house tilts. They aborted their twins and he was forced to bury them by the Mekong River. Herringbone pattern of bricks on a bathroom floor. Exhale, always spring into sleet, here now bursts. In this world, we walk barefoot on embers, gazing at irises. She adjusts the light and scrapes plaque off his teeth. He sips green snail tea and discerns coincident crystals. They tore off each other's clothes, dipping apple slices into honey. They take a first bite. Inhale, here. Sleet into spring now bursts. If you light a citronella candle, mosquitoes can't smell you. A neighbor analyzes air vectors to prepare a response to a dirty bomb. Flame on a lake. Diagnosed with Parkinson's, a man gives notice to his wife to vacate the husk of their home. Have I acted without body? You admire blossoming red yarrow, but a child comes along and uproots it. After an aneurysm, a basket restorer leans on a cane at his ex-wife's funeral. Smoke issues from his wrists and he barks, be wind, flame. Shaggy manes push up through grass near a sandbox. A daughter gives her father a tin flamingo. During the night, a raccoon lifts the lid to a compost can, eats. Before first light strikes the apricots on branches, you limb human acts in the visible world. Smashing a jewelry case with a hatchet, he grabs a necklace from the splintered glass and races. 
into oblivion. Oblivion is also digging up carrots in cool, pungent air, cottonwoods branching along the river into yellow flame. It's in tropical rain where 3,000 people in an amphitheater swaying under umbrellas chant poesia, poesia. To the far left and right, two streams cascade the steps, Vietnamese, English, Hindi, and Spanish ozone the air. A warm, waxy light flows across their skin as they make the rough silk of love. Last night, he gazed at the curve of her eyelids while she slept. A tiny spider hangs a web between a fishing rod and thermostat. A biologist considers how hydra than algae than frogs repopulate a lake covered in volcanic ash. Vultures yank on a buffalo. Somewhere a chigger acts as a vector of scrub typhus. An architect conceived a rectangular pool inlaid with stones and on three sides windows in the building from ankle to knee level, past reflections of sky. Looking east to the opening, you find this slit of dreams can't be repeated. Someone sneezes. A veterinary surgeon bicycling to work is slammed by a car into a coma. You try shifting the slant of your pen, the strokes of your ink. Recall when you flung a tea bowl onto the sidewalk, then tried to glue the shards together. Now hammerhead sharks whirlpool inside you. In the volcanic shapes of clouds, visible time. To the driver who brakes at a red light but rear ends his vehicle, the driver shouts, horse piss. Follow a slate path. You do not come to an entrance, but encounter another blank wall. I need walls to destroy walls. I ache to give people azalea, persimmon, emptiness, so they can be lit from within. If I place a small square window in the corner at floor level, if water spills off a cantilevered roof slab onto a pool and you see, here, wait, what is my grandmother whisking tea saying with her hands? This is no park where bones and teeth are scattered in the grass. I need to treat my cast-in-place concrete like sea urchin, a folding paper screen. A white gravel path leads you past another concrete screen. So it's about walls, light, silencing the noise of trucks and yells in the street. Someone once stuck a concealed firearms prohibited sign near my recessed entrance. I detest bayonets. I need a keyless key. You come to a circular oval lotus pond and in the center, straw mushrooms rise into the visible world. It's a stairway that descends to the entrance. You step into an alcove foyer where facing a blank wall you sit and at sunset light sinks in and grazes your shoulders from behind. The sky lightens behind the heart-shaped leaves. While we slept, a truck filled with plutonium lumbered down the highway. At 6 a.m., the willow branches swing and I tilt on waves. I will tilt when I rake gravel, uncoil a hose, loosen the spigot. Green are the lilac and willow leaves. Now my tongue runs along your scar. Or size bead and we wick into flame. Reflected on glass, a row of track lights is superimposed on cordate leaves outside the window. A small mouth bass aligns with a cottonwood shadow in the pond. To wait is to ache 
joy, despair, crave, fret, whirl, bloom, relax at the unfolding center of emptiness. I tilt on the outgoing tide of my breath. Dead, how can that be? A woman sobs as the airplane taxis to the gate. Flames on water, the whir of a hummingbird behind my eyelids. These are means by which we live. Joy, grief, delight, straw mushrooms rising into the visible world. Wisps of rabbit brush are all that remain of general's dreams. A branch of a river rejoins a river. Flip a house and its shelter. Flip it again and cabin it's open. Wine is poured. Dogs yap. People joke and laugh. Sandhill cranes swirl and descend into a cornfield. We ampere each other. A bus stops. A child gets off, starts walking on a red clod road. Nothing in sight in all directions. A rose flame under our skin, hummingbird whirring its wings. A rose flame, nothing in sight in all directions. Thank you. Thank you for just unbelievably oh, wonderful reading. Um, uh, Arthur has uh, <coughs> asked he might uh, entertain a few questions, which uh, seems like a fine idea. Any questions? Yes? <laughs> yeah. There, there, there's time. Uh -huh. It happened gradually over time. Um, my own background is, I, I like to say, I'm a science dropout. My mother and father were immigrants from China. And I grew up in New York City, and I was, grew up with a lot of pressure to be good at math and science. And my father graduated from MIT. So um, in high school, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I applied to MIT and um, got there, and I hated it. <laughs> it started writing day and night. And I thought, hmm, I'm in the wrong place. And uh, my second year at MIT, Denise Levertov came there from Berkeley. She'd just been teaching here. And every second sentence out of Denise's mouth was, at Berkeley, this is happening. At Berkeley, this is happening. I thought, well, that's it. I need to go west. And um, so I transferred here. And um, I studied classical Chinese. And my early poems were really modeled on a lot of the Tang poems with the kind of very, the idea of a sort of short, compressed lyric. And at that very early stage, I sort of thought I was turning my back to science. But later on, you know, it became apparent to me that, you know, maybe if you're a Lorca, you can use blood, moon, river, olives, knife again and again. But also that can be so constricting. And after a while, I thought, well, why not put quark, electron, magnetism into a poem? One word isn't inherently more poetic than another. And then as I began to do that, I started to think, well, I have a background in science. I can also utilize the structures of science. Why not begin to incorporate string theory, for instance? Um, and if my science knowledge had just stopped at MIT, it would have remained very rudimentary. But um, in Santa Fe, I um, began to meet a number of theoretical physicists who worked in Los Alamos. And I actually was good friends with the head of the what's called the T Division, uh, theoretical physics. And I. Um, in the early 1980s, met Murray Gell-Mann, who's a Nobel laureate in physics and who um, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the quark, actually. And uh, Murray is a linguist, and he knows about 15 languages. And I would have these wonderful conversations with 
Murray about language and about etymology and also about science and the idea of string theory and dimensions curled inside of dimensions. And that became a source of inspiration. Um, and again, I thought, well, why not use it? Why not develop it? Um, I was married for 18 years to a Hopi weaver, and my son is one quarter Hopi. So I not only taught for 22 years at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where I met students from over 200 tribes, but um, my ex-wife's family was from Monkopi, uh, Third Mesa, and I would go to ceremonies, and my father-in-law then took me into the kiva, and I would be up all night watching the men chant and pray. And, and there are certain things I wouldn't write about, for instance, like what it was like in that sacred space. But on the other hand, um, I think it was Auden who said, poets above all else are passionate about language. And I discovered that Hopi had a male and a female language. And that fascinated me. And that found its way into poems and that idea of parallax of different perspectives. And then over time, Again, initially, I thought, I'm not going to write about Native peoples. That's not my culture. And then I was married into that culture. And then, you know, 22 years of working with students, um, this woman, D.G. Okpik, came into my office. And she said, we want to give you a gift back. And she put that jar of Labrador tea on my office desk. And I didn't know I was going to write a poem about it. But I went home, and I brewed the tea according to her instructions. And I looked at the rusty leaves under the, the hairs under the leaves, and I watched how the color of the water changed. And I had this kind of idea. I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting instead of, you know, usually there's that idea of starting a poem and coming back and circling back and closing it off. But rather than closing it off, I had, I liked sort of secrets to poems. And I thought, what if in the course of describing the Labrador tea, it's as if the tea is steeping in the consciousness and things are soaking up and being revealed over time. Um, so I found myself sort of basically over time saying I need to be able to use anything and everything um, as a poet. So it wasn't like a conscious step, but ultimately I like to think of it as, as braiding and um, in the kipu image, which is um, so I learned a lot about fiber from my ex-wife. She used to spin and dye her own wool, particularly indigo and cochineal. And so it wasn't like book knowledge. I would see her physically carding the wool, spinning it, dyeing it. And then I would think, well, that's a great metaphor for language, too. And then I, in this book, turned nouns into verbs. And I had this idea of, well, why not use different disciplines? And Murray, for instance, taught me that the word complexity etymologically has the word plex, which means to braid, and cum means wither together. So Murray's revelation to me was he said complexity isn't about taking lots of elements and throwing them into a pot and boiling them down. It's about maintaining the integrity of each individual strand, and then the strands reinforce and strengthen each other, but they keep their own integrity. And I thought, what a great metaphor for working with language. Why not have the language of science or the language of botany or the language of nature and different elements that are spun together so that they can enrich each other? Um, yes? What made you first want to start writing poetry? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I remember being very bored in a math class at MIT, and the professor was putting up all these very advanced equations. And I just looked at my piece of paper, and I jotted a few words down. And I just thought I was just doodling. And I went home, and then I was writing a few more. And um, I think something happened where I realized that the math and science was imposed from the outside. On top of me, it was sort of this expectation. And then language was sort of bursting from the inside out that um, in that kind of environment, I didn't have that sense of who I was or what I was going to do. And then when I started to write, I just became so excited. It was just like an endless process of discovery. So I was just constantly writing, and I didn't 
think. They, I mean, I'm sure they were all really bad poems, but I was just like writing and writing, and then I uh, was reading whatever I could find, and I remember reading, you know, Creeley, Snyder, Duncan. Well, when Denise came, it was like she had all these poets come and read, and it was a revelation to hear their voices and get a sense of how their voices were working. But I think initially it was just like a little hinge opened up and words just started to sprout and grow. And I didn't know then, but of course it changed my life. Sure, John. Okay. Um, John and I had uh, lunch uh, today, and I, I was uh, telling a really famous story from Japanese um, tea ceremony, which was really influential for me at a certain stage. Because I think in my 20s, I really wanted, I had that idea of a poem as a well-wrought urn, you know, from the West, as a beautiful artifact, um, Keats's urn, for instance. Um, and in, in the Rikyu legend, uh, which I, I love and think about often, um, a merchant in Kyoto wants to impress Rikyu with his great taste in tea ceremony. So he pays a small fortune to buy this bowl by a renowned potter, and he invites Rikyu to come and do tea ceremony. And at the end, he is hopeful Rikyu is going to say, oh, you have wonderful taste. This was great. And the merchant, in fact, asks, you know, how was it? And Riku says, it was fine. And he walks out the door. And the merchant is so angry. He's spent this fortune to impress Riku. He thinks it's got this whole famous lineage. And Riku's totally uninterested and walks out the door. And in the legend, the merchant picks up the uh, pot and he, in a fit of anger, throws it on the floor and smashes it. And then I've read two different accounts. One is a friend and one is a servant. And let's say it's the friend, he gathers all the shards and pieces and he tries to glue them back together. And of course he can't restore that original shape and it's very irregular and um, there's spaces missing, but he pieces it together as best he can and he glues it and he puts it back on the shelf. And three years later, Riku comes through the village and he's asked to do tea ceremony. And he picks this bowl off the shelf and he says, this is the most fantastic tea bowl I've ever encountered. Who made it? And I've often thought about, okay, who did make it? There's the potter who created the original pot. There's the merchant who, and it interests me that it's emotion that shatters the sort of well-made vessel. There's the friend or the servant who tries to glue it back together. There's also Riku who initiates the whole thing by walking out the door. So the layers of that uh, fascinate me, but it became a metaphor for my own sense of um, having to break apart my own conception of a poem as something that was sort of well-made, that was sifted out, that had this Tang Dynasty poems, if you know them, have this incredible refinement of language and rhythm and image but they're also claustrophobic after a while. And um, so at that stage, it was really helpful for me to break it apart. And when I did that, the sequences began to happen. I began to experiment with taking apart the linear order of a poem. I would sometimes write out the poem and then cut them up and make the end the beginning and move the beginning down toward the end, or I would take a poem that I thought was done and then erase out sections and look at possible fragments and I would cut them out and then I would juxtapose them and I like this idea of creating stillness or the fragment inside of a larger motion and then a lot of it was just like exploration well what happens if this shard of language is here and this one is here and do they really go together or maybe there's something in between or uh, and it just became endlessly fertile for me. Let's stop here. I think that's a good place to end. Thank you for coming.